let's actually get started. Uh, let's get going. We have a lot to cover today, so I'm super excited about uh, the content that Sean is bringing uh, to us. It's uh, it's it's fresh. It's new. It's something different. Um, but before we get started and pass, before I pass it on to Sean, uh, just really quickly, if you're new, please mute yourself. Um, if you want to ask any questions or have any comments, we encourage you to do so and just use the chat and send it to everyone. For technical issues, Pink Tomomi, um, many of you already know her. Um, and um, yeah, spread the word around Technocon, especially if you find it useful. Uh, we do have a Twitter handle. I don't know how much Twitter is used these days. Uh, but we also have a Slack channel, and we'll talk about that as well. Super quickly, we started way back when, 2018. It started as an annual conference. Uh, we ran that in 2018, 2019, and then switched over to uh, monthly roundtables, uh, which you're participating in right now. And uh, we always look for speakers. This is a community by us, for us. So if you have a story to tell, uh, even if you have an, an idea of a story, uh, ping the moment, and we'll we'll work it out. We'll find some some jewel there that's worth sharing with others. Um, so with that, I just also wanted to acknowledge the board. Uh, so behind the scenes, there's a group of us that help make this happen. Um, I saw Jasmine is on the line, and so is Andrew. Um, I, I don't know if uh, if we have anybody else uh, here. Uh, just say hello if you're there. And then obviously Tomomi does most of the heavyweight lifting, all the hard work behind the scenes. So, that, so that's uh, quickly uh, who puts this together. Um, and with that, we have some community guidelines. So essentially, you know, think about this being a sacred space for us to share from and learn from one another. So there's a number of things that go along with that. Uh, you can check it out here or technocon.io. He has more details as well if you're new to the uh, to the community. And before I, uh, we, we close later on today, I just want to uh, put in a plug for Benji. Uh, he's going to be speaking in June at the roundtable. So he's going to share how he's been doing, uh, identifying some needs for courses and how he's been developing that at Slack. And Benji has been uh, just a fabulous uh, pr practitioner and out there and pushing the envelope. So I'm super excited to learn more from him. He's spoken a couple of times in the past as well. Uh, so stay tuned for June 15th with Benji uh, from Slack. We are also looking for program managers uh, that have um, the own programs that are related to uh, enablement uh, and want to share their story uh, for Spotlight. So please reach out to Tomomi if you or some of you know uh, would be a good candidate for the community. Um, and uh, what you're going to hear us talk about a lot is uh, this concept of you know, employee enablement, team, team enablement, technical enablement. Essentially, what we noticed is that there's a body of work that many of us program managers own uh, that has to do with enabling our uh, mostly technical folks to do their best work. And that may include things like onboarding, general knowledge sharing, enabling uh, peer, peer and collaborative learning from one another, mentorship, coaching, office hours, technical documentation, and then metrics to tie it all together and learn what's working, what's not. Uh, so that's what we tend to discuss uh, in roundtables. And with that, I'm going to uh, pass it on to Sean. Uh, but before I do, just super quickly, what got me excited about Sean is uh, he comes from uh, education, like K through 12. And um, so he's been with a public school system, uh, actually a private school system for a while, uh, got to push the envelope there, learn some ropes, and then translate that, take that page out of that playbook and put it into the business context and see how that applies to um, leadership development, to people, manager, education, and so on. And I was always excited about, um, you know, how we can rip a page out of another industry and like how that transfers into what we do because it ultimately creates for a different viewpoint, uh, adds creativity to what we do. Uh, and I know whenever I've gone to my kids' uh, school, I was always impressed by how they approach uh, just culture building and leadership development at schools. And so there's a, definitely a lot we can learn from uh, from that context and, and, and hopefully get some fresh ideas for uh, what we do. So with that, I'm going to pass it on uh, to Sean. Welcome. Thank you, Marco. And happy Star Wars Day to everyone. I managed not to dress as a Wookiee. You're welcome. 
So today we're going to be talking about how to become a better manager or leader by, cha by channeling your best teachers. So I want to ask you a question. What made your best teachers the best? I think it's that they understood your brain and how it learns. They knew elements of neuroscience, psychology, cognitive science, and learning science that allowed them to create optimal learning experiences for you and your fellow students. And those elements are just as useful to leaders and managers. So in this presentation, you're going to learn some ideas from education that you can add to your leadership and management toolbox to supercharge your ability to work with people. You're going to learn to create safe spaces for learning and performance. You're going to learn how to get the best possible outcomes from the people you manage. And ultimately, you're going to move closer to what should be every leader's goal to manage like a teacher. So let's start with some expectations because this is what we do in the classroom. First, please be present even if you can't be seen. It's fine to keep your camera off. I know some people prefer that. Some people have reasons they need it off. That's fine. I would love to see your beautiful faces. So would everyone else here. But I understand that not everyone can. So just please don't multitask. It doesn't work. I can show you the research that proves this. Just stay with me and you'll learn a lot. Second is make sure to keep your mic muted unless you choose to speak. We will mute people if we hear background noise. No offense. I'm going to give you a lot of information today. You might feel a bit overwhelmed, and that's a perfectly normal response to having a lot of information thrown at you, so don't feel bad if it happens. There's going to be a recording of this session, and hopefully we will have time for Q&A at the end. And if questions come up, please drop them in the chat starting with a Q. And if I'm able to, I'll address them while I keep us on time. If I can't, I'll get your questions at the end. And that said, if there's something really important that you couldn't follow or that I missed, do interrupt me rather than wait to the end, please. So why lead like a teacher? So I've been in education for going on 20 years now. I've been in K-12 for 14 of those, four in adult and higher ed. I'm now running my own educational consulting business. I have a master's in education from a teacher's college at Columbia. And I've been a, a people manager for 10 of the last 11 years. And so what I can tell you from all of this experience is that what we know about good education is influenced by many other fields, neuroscience, neuropsychology, cognitive science, psychology. And that's because students are humans and understanding the human brain allows us to help it learn better. And so managing people effectively requires a similar understanding of those humans. And I found meaningful crossovers of, I have not shared my screen. Thank you so much. I was so happy with my graphics here and you can't see them, thank you. <laughs> there it is. So um, there we go. So the I, I found some really meaningful crossovers of educational theory and technique to leadership and management and vice versa. It goes in both directions. And the more I learn about education and leadership, the more crossovers I find. And the more I know about one, the better I get at the other. And so today, like I said, we're going to be discussing those ideas from education that you can add to your leadership and managerial toolbox and learn to lead and inspire like your favorite teacher. So before we get started here, just a little background. I'm the founder and CEO of Effective EDU, which helps people apply research and best practices to education, training, and presentation. And if you or your company are looking to improve things like teaching, onboarding, training, or presentations, you can find more information on my website, effectiveedu.com. And if you need more help making sense of today's session, or you want specific coaching on applying education to leadership, I have a special offer on my website where you can get a big discount on my consulting and you can dig further into these ideas. And so I've just posted that in the chat. Onward. Before I start telling you what I think, I'm gonna do something that a good teacher should do, which is to get you to do some thinking. So I want you to think back to an amazing teacher, manager, or leader that you have had personally. And I want you to think about how they empowered you to do your best learning or work. And then I'll give you a second for that. Really do want you to think. Then I want you to distill that into some actual specific things that they did that you remember. What did those outstanding people do? And let's put a few of those thoughts in the chat or just come off of mute and share what that person did that made them outstanding. Okay, so Stacy says, talk to me like I was an individual person, not just another student. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Yes. Actionable feedback. Okay, here they come. 
empathic, good communicators, eliciting thoughts. Oh, it's going too fast now. Uh, before telling us the correct answer. I love that, Laura. Saw the potential in me that I didn't see myself, said Marco. Provided resources, not answers. Yep. Gave me opportunities. Yeah, these are great. Okay. So we're going to explore some three areas today that I think are going to help you uh, as takeaways from education that you can bring into your work in, in business. And so the first of those is building a supportive working and learning environment. The second is creating meaningful and impactful outcomes. And then we're going to talk about how to create opportunities for transformative learning and work. Sound all right? So we're starting with a supportive environment. Why do I say we want a supportive environment? Why do we want a supportive working and learning environment? So just drop a few thoughts in the chat or speak up if you like. I told you I was going to make you think. Okay, so Stacy says it lowers stress. We actually will be talking about stress. Psychological safety, Jasmine, did you see my presentation already? Rachel talks about comfort, feeling included. Yep, absolutely. These are great reasons. Yeah, and, and the reason is that people, in summary, that people do their best work and their best learning when they feel supported and valued. And there are some environments where high pressure is just part of the deal. And high pressure gets results, but it can also really shut down creative thought. And we're going to talk about that. So the best environment, in my mind at least, in a lot of educators' minds, is one that leverages pressure because it does enhance performance, but cushions it with support and safety. Oops. Moving on. So looking at this list, think about what comes to mind for you. If you have any comments, just drop them in the chat. Um, I'm going to move on, though, as we go. But, uh, but just think about this list. Psychological safety, growth mindset, intrinsic motivation, feedback, and mistakes. What do those things bring to mind for you? And we're going to discuss all of them right now. So we're going to start with Abraham Maslow, who developed something that you've probably heard of called the hierarchy of, uh, the, the hierarchy of human needs. And so in school, those needs are actually pretty similar to in work. They're really about basic human needs, like you have to have food and water before you can do better things, right? And so when we think about school and work, the way that we think about these needs are physiological needs, meaning physical needs. You need to have a desk, right? You need to have a water fountain or a water cooler. Um, in work, you would need to have income. That would actually be a, a pretty basic need for, for someone at work. When you start to think about the next level up, safety, you think about things like fairness, right? physical and mental safety. Certainly in the situations that we have in today's school, safety is pretty paramount. You need fair treatment by other people, safe working conditions, benefits at a job, right? And as we go up, these needs and the specific needs for school and work become more and more advanced, right? So you move through things like friendship to achievement to mastery. And so Maslow's point is that the lowest needs have to be satisfied before the higher ones can be. You cannot become self-actualized if you're constantly afraid of getting fired. And so my question to you is, if someone is afraid of being wrong, they have fear of failure, what is the lowest level that hasn't been met? Drop those in the chat. Drop your thoughts in the chat. Lowest level that hasn't been met. Okay, I see safety, safety. Safety, I think we're getting the picture. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about psychological safety. And we're gonna talk about what a couple of influential researchers have found. So psychological safety is the sense of confidence and trust that you won't be punished for speaking up or making mistakes. And so we have one person, William Kahn, who in 1990 came up with the idea that a major key to employee engagement and organizational success is psychological safety. Kahn said it leads to a higher sense of meaning and motivation, and it leads to taking risks that lead to growth and innovation. Then Edmondson, Amy Edmondson, extended Kahn's work and found that psychological safety was one of a few major factors that led to better performance in teams. She wrote a book called Teaming as a verb, not as a noun. And so why does all of this matter? Well, both Kahn and Edmondson found that organizations with higher levels of psychological safety had higher levels of learning and performance. Okay, 
misconception alert. Here's our friend again. This is not about being nicey nice. This is not about reducing your standards. It's about creating a high performing environment where people are held to a high bar, but where employees can operate creatively and without fear. And basically that creates trust. And that's what you have in a good classroom. And so by leveraging some of the ways that teachers create supportive learning environments, we can actually improve the way that we lead and manage. And so we're going to start with something called the growth mindset. Carol Dweck came up with the growth mindset in the 1990s in her studies of students. Now, she came up with two ideas. There are two kinds of mindsets that she talks about. One is the growth mindset, and the other is the fixed mindset. And the way that, to, to just quickly explain this, when something is difficult, a person with a growth mindset tries harder. I can learn to do this. A person with a fixed mindset will try something else. I can't do this. And Dweck loved this little word, yet. It's a very subtle tweak, but you can add it to the end of a negative sentence. So I'm not good at math becomes I'm not good at math yet. And in Dweck's research, she was able to cultivate a growth mindset that led to improvement in struggling students. Now, Dweck also talks about the power of praise. And it turns out that our old methods of praising are not good. Praising results, such as great job, you got an A, are way less effective than praising the outcome and the process. You got an A. Wow, you must have worked really hard. Yes, to me, exactly. And so if you try this, follow it by asking people to tell you exactly how their process led to success. You praise the process and the results. That's the best thing you can do. And so my question is, again, we're going to get you thinking, how might you apply this to the workplace? Go ahead and drop ideas in the chat or go speak up. Don't celebrate big wins, celebrate incremental progress. Love that, Laura. Yeah, well said. I think actually Laura just got <laughs> the right answer there. Good job. So, and, and I, I'm going to praise your process. You must have worked really hard on that, Laura. So yeah, we, we want to use the power of yet to modify a fixed mindset, right? If somebody says, I'm terrible at this thing that you're asking me to do, you can tweak that. It doesn't have to be formulaic, but you can actually turn the negative statement into a more optimistic one. And then as Laura said, celebrating progress and process is just as important, if not more so than celebrating the outcome. All right, let's talk about motivation because that's closely related to mindset. There are two types of motivation. So intrinsic motivation is internal. It's held by the person. So for example, you care about your work, therefore you work extra hours when they're needed. Extrinsic motivation is external. That relies on rewards from others. And so the example of that is I pay you overtime for working extra hours and therefore you work extra hours when needed. And so my question to you on this one is which of these do you think is faster to build? Intrinsic or extrinsic? And you can just drop an I or an E in the chat if it's faster. Okay, I see a few extrinsics. Okay, I'm not going to tell you which one of those is right because I'm going to ask you another question, which is, is intrinsic or extrinsic motivation going to last longer? Jasmine, I swear you've read my slides. <laughs> okay, so Alfie Cohn who is an author and thinker about education, wrote a book called Punished by Rewards, and that may give away the answer here. So Cohn found that the best overall results come from intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation gets results too. But if you take away the extrinsic motivator, like I stop paying you overtime, those results are going to drop off. And so basically, we want to build intrinsic motivation in our employees because intrinsically motivated people will learn and work better. And so that comes from praising the process, like we talked about with growth mindset. It comes from giving meaningful tasks, helping people see the importance of their work. And it comes from building ownership and self-efficacy, because employees who are empowered to make meaningful decisions tend to feel more intrinsically motivated. Let's talk about feedback. 
We've all heard of this. Maybe we've experienced a performance review. Did you get shivers when I said that one? So studies of feedback have shown that it has a significant positive effect on learning, particularly when the feedback is directly aimed at improving performance. Now, effective feedback is specific, actionable, timely, and clear. And that means that, both, that it's both understandable and it's linked to clear goals and criteria. Okay. Um, Stuart, that's an, how would that explain people switching? Well, yeah, it's a good question. And, and Stuart, let's, let's come back to that. If you can hold that thought, um, maybe till the end, if we have time, we'll come back to that for questions because there's, there's a few things potentially in there. And I want to make sure that, uh, that we talk about feedback here first. So, uh, effective feedback I said is specific, actionable, timely, and clear. So my question to you here is what kinds of feedback might perform the worst? And you can drop your thoughts in the chat or just come out and say it. Vague feedback is pretty awful. Negative, yep. Oh, Jasmine, I love that you went there. Overly positive. Yeah, it feels kind of smarmy, right? You did this wrong. Yeah, focusing on just the error instead of constructive. <laughs> I see. Hope that hasn't happened to you. Um, so yeah, the worst performing feedback in these studies were negative or extrinsic. And so while we're here, we're going to talk real briefly about grades versus feedback, because grades are a form of feedback, but they're also an extrinsic motivator. And pure constructive feedback, written feedback, is an intrinsic motivator if it's done well. And so guess which of those results in better and more durable learning, grades or feedback? Feedback. I don't even need to ask you to put it in the chat. I'm sure you're thinking it. This is science, people. This really works. So you need to create a constant flow of actionable feedback and encourage feedback from your employees as well. And that's going to help create a space where feedback is not threatening in either direction and it's expected regularly. And that creates the best environment for learning and growth. And please, 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 if you're going to say something in a performance review, say it in constructive, informal feedback first. Really important. All right, I want you to think for a second. We're not going to respond here, but just think for a second. What is it like to be wrong? And what is it like to be right? What do you feel in each situation? And what do you learn? Just think about that. Being wrong versus being right. What do you feel? What do you learn? So when I think about this, being right is fun, right? You feel good. You confirm that you were right. Maybe you get praised for being right. You get an A. When you're wrong, you might feel bad, but that's when you actually learn. <laughs> I love the chat here. Being wrong, I'll say it again, is when you actually learn. So from a learning perspective, wrong is better than right. And that's actually, you'll notice, a greater than sign, not an arrow. So let's geek out for a second. When we talk about learning, we're talking about actual physical changes in your brain. You're looking at an actual video of a brain cell. That's a neuron. And your neurons physically change to make connections to other neurons. And those connections are the physical manifestation of your learning. So being right is an affirmation of what you know, but you don't make new connections by being right. You actually do reinforce the connections you've made. It strengthens memory, but it's not the same thing as learning. And being wrong is when actual learning happens. And so we need to embrace mistakes because they illuminate misconceptions and misunderstandings that can be corrected. And if we correct a misunderstanding, the person learns. So as teachers or leaders, our job is to make being wrong feel less threatening. And speaking of being wrong, I want my students to feel safe trying things they don't know. And that's what leads to growth and learning. And so I have to normalize making mistakes in any learning experience in order to build psychological safety. Now, the best teachers make their classrooms safe places to make mistakes. But saying mistakes are welcome is not enough if someone is afraid of failing. So what do we do? Well, a great teacher might explain the reason mistakes are important learning experiences, which I just did. They might celebrate mistakes as opportunities for learning and then literally get excited if someone says something wrong. They might even make mistakes themselves, allow themselves to make mistakes or talk about big mistakes that they've made and what they've learned from them. 
And managers and leaders can do the same. You don't want to overlook the mistakes. You want to correct them, but also don't default to punishing them like Stacy's comment and I saw at least one others. Because if you can make the environment supportive of mistakes and then use them as a learning opportunity, particularly as an opportunity for introspection about the process, your people will feel psychologically safe and will likely perform better in the long run. And also be humble and acknowledge your own mistakes because it's a great way to model for your employees how they should behave when you screw up, when they screw up, <laughs> when both of you screw up, because we will. So we're going to take a quick look back now at how we create a strong and safe environment. Psychological safety is huge. Remember, psychologically safe teams produce better and more innovative work, and their people feel better about themselves and their work. And we can foster psychological safety by building a growth mindset, which means praising both the process and the outcome. And that's one of the ways that we build intrinsic motivation, which is the internal motivation. It's far more powerful than extrinsic motivators. We foster psychological safety, a growth mindset, and intrinsic motivation by giving feedback that's constructive, timely, actionable, and specific. And we create a safe space for making mistakes because they are the moments when learning happens. And we do more than say it's okay to make mistakes. We celebrate them or we model them ourselves. All right. We're going to do something that I'll actually explain a little bit later. It's called a stretch and refresh break. And I want you to just take a second, just stretch out maybe twist and crack your back if you need to, like I do, whatever you need to do, shake out. If you want to stand up real quick, just do that. But this is a 10 second break. We're coming right back. And I just want you to think about how that left you feeling. We'll do it again later, um, but it's, it's a good way to refresh real quick. We're going to now talk about creating meaningful and impactful outcomes. And so first, I want to get a handle on the notion of impact. So when I say impact, what do I mean? Go ahead and drop thoughts in the chat or go ahead and speak up. <laughs> 10 burpees, says Marco. Uh, outcomes that lead to measurable improvement, sure. Something that's measurable, sure. I have a feeling from learning from Jasmine already that Jasmine has predicted my next few slides, but we'll keep going anyway. So Stuart says measurable change, positive or negative. Sure. Hopefully positive, but aligned to objectives. Okay. Meaningful change. Sure. Making a difference. Yeah, absolutely. So then the question is, how do we make that impact happen? Right? So let's discuss a few lessons from education on creating impactful outcomes. All right. So we're going to talk about OKRs. We're going to talk about building focus and buy-in what scaffolding in the zone of proximal development mean, and our all-time favorite stress. So we're going to start with education and some big picture stuff. So when teachers or instructional designers build curriculum, curriculum, they're interested in a couple things at a high level. The first is what you will know or be able to do when you finish. Those are learning goals. And the second is how will I know that you're moving toward the goal or that you've accomplished it? And of course, there's a lot of stuff that goes into a class beyond goals and assessments, like, say, lesson content. But in the grand scheme, as a teacher, I want to know that you have reached the goals I set for you. And so I build goals that tell me what you should accomplish, and I build assessments to measure your progress and your success. And both of these have to be specific, measurable, and observable. So goals are what we want our students to know or be able to do. And again, we want them to be specific, measurable, and observable. And so how do we write a good educational goal? In education, goals are often written as SWABATS, which stands for students will be able to. And so I want to know what would happen if I wrote a goal for this? How, how would you feel if I wrote a goal for this presentation that was students will be able to understand how to make people feel safe? Do you think this is specific, measurable, and observable? Is it any one of those three? Two of those three. How'd I do? Okay, Stuart, excellent. Understand, I love that you keyed in on that. Has potential, thank you, Lisa. <laughs> I was trying. Isn't real in the world, Stuart? I think you mean that it's not, it's not measurable, potentially. Um, neither is safe understand how by doing what exactly may be observable. I would argue that that's not even observable. You can't 
I, I don't know what's in your brain. I have no idea if you know how to make people feel safe, right? So, okay, we know there's a problem with this. Lisa said that it has potential, so let's actually rewrite it, okay? So how would we rewrite that previous goal in a more specific, measurable, and observable way? Go ahead and drop any comments in the chat. What would you change? Okay, so we're getting more specific with which people. Stuart said making peers feel safe. Uh, so increase safety by doing X, Y, and Z. Okay, so now Laura's gotten something that is actually observable, right? We see them doing something that will increase safety. Jasmine said, students will be able to list off ways they can make people feel safe. Okay, so listing, describing, those are some action words that actually demonstrate understanding, which is great. Any other ideas coming in? Looks like maybe not. So yeah, I, I would say that those are a good direction. And the way that I rewrote this was the students will be able to describe three ways to foster psychological safety. Right. So it's not about safe. It's psychological safety, which I've just defined for you. Right. You're going to describe three ways. So now it's measurable and observable because you're describing it. Yeah. And Jasmine, exactly. Describing is not the same as doing it. True, Stuart. Absolutely. And you might want to have you definitely want to have more than one goal. And so a second goal would be that you would actually potentially watch your students do this. They would actually workshop it. OK, very nice. Good work. Assessments allow me to validate progress toward a goal or, uh, or, or validate the success in reaching it. And so there's two forms of assessment. There's formative assessment, which means evaluating progress towards improving future work, and summative assessment, which means evaluating success of an end product like an exam or an essay. And either way, assessments go hand in hand with goals because, say it with me, they must be specific, measurable, and observable. You can't assess something you don't see. I take serious issue with a teacher judging understanding or effort. I hate when people do that because you cannot observe what's in someone's head. I have no idea how hard you've worked on something. I can see how much you've worked on something potentially or what you've produced or what you're able to do with something. I can't see how much you care about it or how much you understand it. And so managers need to take the same stance as teachers. We need to create specific, measurable, and observable goals, and we need to determine how best to assess them in order to create the best possible outcomes, those impactful outcomes we were talking about. And so that takes us to OKRs. And so just to make sure we're all on the same page, I think chances are that the majority of people here know what OKRs are, but let's just make certain you don't assume anything in an educational setting. So objectives are medium to long-term big picture things you want to accomplish, and KRs are shorter term things that demonstrate progress toward a goal. Sounds a little bit like what we just discussed with goals and assessments, right? And so that's the educational side of this. A learning goal is like an objective, it's the end result, and an assessment is like a key result. It's the movement toward that end result. And so it's very possible you're already using OKRs in your leadership or management. If you're not, please look into implementing them. They're really helpful. And what I'm hoping you take from this talk is the need to make them as, say it with me, specific, measurable, and observable as possible, which is what we need to do in education also to measure those goals and objectives. So a good teacher also understands how to keep their students' brains optimally engaged. And this means trying not to overwhelm people with work. So in education, we look at a thing called cognitive overload theory, which is by, or actually cognitive load theory, which is by John Sweller, a uh, theory created by John Sweller, which says that the brain has an extremely limited working memory capacity, but an essentially unlimited long-term memory. So just to break that down for a second, a novice can't process the volume of new information that an expert can because a novice's working memory gets overloaded. So the working memory is short-term memory. If you ever try to remember a 10-digit phone number, you might find success, but it's usually because you're clumping chunks of it. You're not just memorizing 10 digits. And if you ever try to memorize 25 digits, a <laughs> little RAM, exactly. Yes, Jasmine, exactly. Um, if you ever try to memorize 25 digits, 
you're going to fail unless you have actually practiced memory technique. And that's because you have such a bottleneck of working memory. And so we need to, uh, we need to actually help the employee deal with that overload or help the student deal with that overload by not giving too much work or too much information in the first place and actually moving them toward the point where they can do it. And I mentioned that we, we actually did that uh, refresh and stretch break before. We need to give brain breaks because looking at a computer for this long is tiring. We need to reset the brain. And there's research that shows that looking away from a screen and back is enough to reset the brain and sustain focus. And also there's research that shows that exercise and movement is good for thinking. And so both of those things came in when we did that refresh and stretch break before. And I wanna do that again, okay? So just kind of stretch, move around a little bit, crack your neck, right? If you want to stand up, we're gonna be back in a second. And here we are. How do we feel now? We feel better, right? You just feel more energized after that. That's a way to refresh a brain and to reduce cognitive overload. And so giving an employee too much work or work that's too complex results in cognitive overload. And so we have to help them by encouraging them not to work all the time, to take breaks, to refresh their brains and make their work more productive. All right, let's talk about buy-in. Do you remember your middle school math class? Because I sure do. I remember my middle school math teachers saying, okay, we're moving on to chapter two. This is important, everyone pay attention. And then they were into it. That is not enough to build buy-in because creating buy-in and agency is critical in adult learners and adult employees and actually in kids too. And adult learning theory tells us that people really, really want to know why they're learning something and how it relates to their lives and their interests. And so there's an educational technique called the hook. And that's great for building relevance and meaning. And basically it's like where you bait a fish hook to catch a fish, you set a hook to lure the students. And so you can apply this to management too, because creating reason and relevance leads to more impactful performance. And I actually did this when I started. I was talking about taking ideas from education that'll supercharge your leadership abilities. That's a hook. Hopefully that got you interested. And so you want to ensure that your employees understand the meaning of their work and that the work they plan to do is meaningful and impactful. And so that doesn't mean you start every project with a manufactured hook, but helping people see reason and relevance is actually really critical. Scaffolding in education means helping students stretch and achieve more than they can on their own. And this is just like in building a, in a construction project because building a scaffold supports work that a building can't support by itself. Educational scaffolds support work that a person can't support by themselves. And this comes from Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, where Vygotsky defined three levels of learning. And those levels are the level of current understanding, where you can just do the work with no problem. The zone of proximal development, where you can learn through scaffolding, support by a teacher. And the out of reach zone, which I like to call the nope zone. There's no way you're going to learn something here. And so a good teacher tries to sense if a student's in their out of reach zone and pulls them back into the ZPD. Now you may have heard in business that you may have heard these described as the comfort, stretch, and fear zones. And those terms map really nicely onto the ZPD. And so recognizing these zones can make it easier to guide people because if they're in the comfort zone, that's the zone of current understanding, you can push them. And if they're in the fear zone, that out of reach zone, you need to bring them back. We don't want to just push through the fear zone because guess what? There's nothing on the other side except more fear. So recognizing that and pulling people back to the zone of proximal development or that comfort or that uh, stretch zone is actually really critical as a leader or manager. And now let's talk about our favorite stress. So stress is a motivator, but it can also be a hindrance. So the right amount of stress is motivational. You've all had a deadline that you need to meet and somehow you got it done faster than you thought possible. The zone of proximal development, or the stretch zone, is a place of stress. It's pressure to learn or perform beyond your comfort zone. And this is where our brains come in, and understanding our brains comes in, because too much stress will actually work against cognitive processing and learning. So our complex thought processes happen in the prefrontal cortex. That's one of the most advanced areas of your brain, one of the most evolved areas, and that's where critical thinking happens. If you have too much stress, it actually reroutes brain activity from the prefrontal cortex to the amygdala. And that's a much older, less evolved, less advanced part of the brain. Now, have you seen the movie Inside Out? And can you think of a character that might have represented your amygdala?
this is your amygdala. Disney called it fear because, well, you try getting a three-year-old to say amygdala, but the amygdala powers the sympathetic nervous system and it activates your adrenal glands, which produce adrenaline. And so now with the amygdala in the mix and your body full of adrenaline, you're ready to run or fight, but you are not ready to learn. So that fear zone, that nope zone, is not a place where you can learn or work productively. And so leaders and managers need to pull their employees back into the stretch zone or push them out of their comfort zone um, if they start to vary from that zone of proximal development. And so that's where pressure comes in. We can leverage pressure to drive performance, but we don't want to allow that pressure to become overwhelming because it will shut down critical thinking. And that's why we need those psychologically safe environments so that people can try things they've not done before. Oops, missed that one. And so let's take a look back now at our takeaways on how to create impactful outcomes. We start with that big picture. We build goals, ways to measure success. We help our employees focus by taking care of their brains. That's those brain breaks and avoiding cognitive overload. We foster buy-in to the reason and relevance of the work we design. We use scaffold and proximal development to keep our employees in that stretch zone, pull them back from the fear zone. And we leverage stress as a motivator without allowing it to shut down performance and critical thinking. All right. Moving on, because this is the last part, creating transformative learning and working environments. That's what we all want to do. And transformative learning refers to a fundamental shift in a person's beliefs or behaviors. And it's a really big deal in education if you can accomplish it. And so just to go on a tangent for a second, prior to starting my business, my prior two jobs were at adult career change boot camps. And boot camps produced some of the most powerful transformational learning I've ever seen. So learning React programming isn't necessarily transformative, especially if you already knew another programming language. It's learning, definitely learning, but it's not a fundamental change in how you operate if you were already programming. But coming to see yourself as a capable programmer three months after your first programming class or getting a job as a developer when your prior job was a taxi driver, that's transformative learning. And as leaders and managers, we want our employees to adapt and become more capable. And we want them to shift their mindset to meet the changing needs of the business world, especially in the tech industry or a startup. And so how do we do this? Guess what? Education can help. So we're going to talk about a few takeaways from education that can contribute to transformative learning. And just looking at this list, what comes to mind for you? Do you are you familiar with any of these things? Go ahead and drop any comments in the chat or just go ahead and speak up. Sean, it's Andrew. I, all of these kind of are connecting the learning that you're doing into kind of the, the real world, like your 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 experiences and work, or your your the culture that you're in, all, all those sorts of things. So it's not hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Any other thoughts on this? All right. Let's talk about experiential learning. Oh, Andrew got a plus one. Oh, here come the thoughts. Culture of learning, people willing to share personal growth areas require psychological safety. Yeah, Laura, absolutely. Um, so we'll talk about experiential learning because it means what it sounds like, which is learning by doing. And so there's a ton of research on the most effective ways to learn. What it's largely determined is that guided instruction followed by directed practice is the most effective way to learn. And this doesn't mean that you can't learn from other methods. It just means that it's the most effective way to learn. So guided instruction can mean lecture or facilitation. The point is the expert is guiding the learner rather than just having the learner explore things based on their own interest. And <laughs> exactly. Hopefully you start a little smaller than that, Marco. Uh, and directed practice is what you have in sports. It's where a coach determines the appropriate things to work on in practice. And in education, directed practice means the teacher focuses the learner on very specific things that need improvement. Now, nowhere in this does it say a student should learn passively. I did mention lecture. And the lecture hall model, where the brilliance of a professor goes in one ear and out the other for a couple hours, is really not a great one. So there's a learning theory called constructivism, which tells us that learning must be active. And by creating opportunities for the learner to practice what they've learned, we create meaningful and really memorable learning opportunities. Whoops, didn't my, oh good, okay. I thought it froze for a second. Um, 
Now, we can find ways that we can apply this to leadership and management and giving feedback or coaching or advising are a start. There are ways to help you provide expert guided instruction, but you need to find opportunities for your employees to apply what you've told them. That's the directed practice part because otherwise your brilliance may not stick. And so now let's talk about situated learning, which means learning in context. Situated learning can be related to experiential learning, but it can also take it a step further. So think of an apprentice, say in a blacksmith shop. I know there's not many blacksmith shops anymore, but that model of learning was actually very, very effective. And so apprenticeship begins with a total novice who doesn't know their cross peen hammer from their straight peen hammer. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, I, I Googled those because I had no idea what the difference was either. But the novice is given increasingly complex tasks that over time help them learn the knowledge and skill to become an expert blacksmith. There's no lecture in a blacksmith shop. All the learning is done experientially. It's done in context. And internships are much like this. School, unfortunately, is often not, but it'd be great if it could be. And so we covered adult learners need for reason and relevance earlier. We just talked about experiential learning and situated learning is a great way to build relevance and real world application that the adult will actually find meaningful. And let's talk about that culture of learning. We've all heard of cultures of learning. Schools are meant to be learning cultures. That's kind of their whole point, right? What I found really interesting, though, in my work is that sometimes that culture of learning stops at the students. There are some teachers who prefer not to change. And I once got yelled at by a teacher who wanted to keep using photocopies of handouts rather than learn to use a computer. And that was in 2017. Now, I disagree with this approach, but I also understand it because teachers have really hard jobs and really low pay, and I think it's actually perfectly reasonable for them to feel a lack of desire to devote more time and energy to change. But here's why I disagree. I built a professional development program for teachers that applied learning theory to the use of ed tech. And the teachers definitely had to learn and change, and it was hard. And here's what we found. The teachers were actually energized by the experience. Some of them changed their entire approach to teaching, and they reported far higher levels of satisfaction and motivation as a direct result of those changes in learning. Learning is powerful, and creating a culture of learning is transformative. But asking people to learn for its own sake, especially if it's just one more thing they have to do every day, will not work. We actually paid my teachers $3,000 to take that professional development course. Yes, this is an extrinsic motivator, but it was necessary to get people in the door in order to develop their intrinsic motivation over time. And so I'm not suggesting that you pay people extra to learn. It'd be a nice start, but you don't have to. But finding ways to support their learning by offsetting their obligations can be a great way to show the value that you place on learning. And that can lead that shift to a learning culture. Okay, let's talk about what we've learned today. So building a supportive environment creates psychological safety, and that is necessary for learning and growth. It's fostered by creating a space where mistakes are opportunities, where feedback is constructive, and where praise goes to the process just as much as the results. Impactful outcomes start with the big picture and are supported by personal buy-in as well as external scaffolding and judicious application of stress. And transformative learning and working environments can be created through applied learning as well as the energy that actually comes from the learning itself. And so there you have it. Takeaways from the classroom that you can bring to the boardroom and that will help you lead by like, and that will help you lead like your favorite teacher. And finally, I would love to get your feedback. Uh, as you might have been able to tell, there was a large amount of time that went into building this and hopefully you found it worth something. And so please say thank you with feedback. I'm putting that link in the chat. You can just open that up. I would ask that before we leave today, you actually do this because if you're like me and you don't do this before you leave today, you will forget that it ever existed. So please go ahead and open that link that's in the chat. Give me some feedback. I read every bit that I get and I really appreciate it. And so with that, I will stop sharing and we can move into Q&A mode. And I remember there was a question way back I'm trying to find it. Tomomi, if you can find that question, can you pull that up for me? Oh, 
Oh, I see. Stuart's question was, how would that explain people switching jobs to pursue higher salary, which is an extrinsic reward at a different company? It's a, it's a good question. Um, it, that is definitely an extrinsic motivator. Salary is an extrinsic motivator. So I, I think your question was, what's longer lasting? Uh, or, or why is intrinsic motivation longer lasting than ex extrinsic? And so I would answer this by saying, and Stuart, correct me, am I, am I getting that right? Yeah, I think um, what, what I'm what I'm hearing there is that often when we hear talk about learning, we're like, you know what, intrinsic motivation, that's the way to go. It's always better than extrinsic motivation. And I found that it it is often underappreciated and is powerful to include intrinsic motivation but they're not like replacements for each other. Correct. For instance, often my team, the learning team is brought in to help solve a problem. And upon researching the problem and interviewing people and getting the root cause of what, what this is, creating a learning content, learning solution is only part of it. And half the problem would be solved by better accountability structures mm -hmm. that have yeah, nothing to do with stuff. learning. Yeah. some extrinsic stuff um and that would that would much better solve the problem that the company wants solved yeah and definitely they're, I guess they're both there yeah they they both have value yeah and and I, I don't mean to say that intrinsic motivation is not something to try like i said we did a professional development program where we paid three thousand dollars which is not a small amount of money for a teacher to take a bi-weekly course for a year we paid that knowing that it was an extra an extrinsic motivator um but th those things can can go hand in hand. And so going back to, for example, the boot camp model, right? People join a boot camp because they want a better salary, because they want a better life. They, they go into this, say, the, the sort of classic example is an Uber driver who wants to become a computer programmer. They make a much higher salary their first year. That is completely extrinsic. But hopefully... They also learn to love to program in that time and they learn and they're going into it because they think they'll love it and not just because they'll make more money because we've all heard these stories of you know, lawyers and people who make tons of money and after 20 years in the field, they go, God, my, my life feels worthless. I'm going to go find something really meaningful to do. And that's the need for intrinsic motivation. So it's not to say that extrinsic motivation won't last. If you keep paying higher and higher salaries, sure, somebody's going to stay with you. But that moment when that higher salary can't keep going up because of budget cuts or, you know, external effects or you know, whatever the business situation that you're in, people are going to start thinking about leaving. And if you can build the intrinsic motivation to be at your particular company, it might outlast the need for the extrinsic. Related to that, one question that often comes up is, um, you know, it, this is, it, and it's usually around collaborative peer learning, right? So the concept is great. We love the idea of, you know, everyone's an expert and everyone is motivated to stand up and share themselves with their coworkers. And, and how do you how do you create that as a culture, right? Like if I'm in a busy engineer and my work is evaluated based on the code that I need to ship, or you know, that's my job description. Uh, how do I, in addition to that, um, also share my knowledge and, you know, contribute to others? And, and so it speaks to that culture of learning, right? Like, how do we establish that? Like, any tips, tricks, hacks there? Yeah, I mean, I think a big part of that is creating a perceived value of learning. And it's, it's difficult in an organization to prioritize learning when you have to, whatever, ship your software, finish your sprint, um, you know, make it to the, whatever the board review of how the company is doing, all of that stuff is, is really big and really pressing. And so learning often takes a back seat. And I think that companies that do this really well tend to find ways to not just encourage, but to really prioritize learning. So it's not just, okay, everyone needs to go and take a course on Udemy. It's, we're going to make time during the week that is sacred for you to take a course in Udemy or, you know, for employees to, to share. I've tried to set up like employee training programs where it's sort of a round table and somebody each week shares something that they know. That's a great way to encourage learning, right? And also just show value in the people that you have. And, but I think it's, it's all about that perceived value because 
every company wants people to learn, but a lot of companies make the mistake of saying, if I just tell my employees to do one more thing, which is learning, they'll do it and we'll learn more. And it's not just adding the thing, it's providing the support for the thing and the value of the thing. And that, that value really comes from the support. And the support is saying, um, you know, this is something that we really want you to do and we're going to make room for you to do it. Got it. Um, and Andrew shared a, uh, a talk from Chris from Microsoft, some, some impediments. Uh, we had Chris on that. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, and Jasmine had a question. Um, have you considered how you might build psychological safety or motivation differently based on neurodiversity? Great question, Jasmine. Yeah. So I'm not an expert, uh, admittedly, on neurodiversity, but, but I do have some thoughts. One is that... Um, so when I started my presentation, I set up the expectations on the second slide, right? And something that is really, really helpful for neurodiverse people is knowing what's expected. Because when we don't set, thank you, Andrew, when we don't set those expectations and just expect everyone to operate in the exact same way, someone who has difficulty operating in that way could potentially feel really uncomfortable. And that's not psychologically safe. So one of the things that I said in those expectations was, I would love to see your face, but I understand if you can't show it to me. And that's fine. Um, another thing that I didn't say, I forgot to say it, is that if you feel the need to get up and move around while you listen, that's fine. And that's something that's an indicator to someone who, in particular, someone who's potentially autistic or somewhere on the spectrum, that if they feel that need to, to move and they're feeling that stress, don't feel like you have to perform for me by sitting in front of the camera. You can get up and you can move around and I will not judge you for it. And so I think those expectations go a really long way in creating psychological safety and motivation because if I don't do that, then the person who feels that need to move feels like th they spend so much energy on trying to perform that they can't spend their energy on the actual value that they can bring. Because ultimately, it really doesn't matter if you sit in your seat while I'm talking, if you're present. And that's, what I, that's why I said it the way I did. Be present. You don't have to be visible, but be present. And, and so those kinds of expectations are really helpful. There may be meetings where it's necessary to show your face and setting that expectation is helpful too. You don't have to always default to it's fine to have your cameras off. If we're going to be having a conversation and we need to see each other's faces, please turn on your camera when you're talking or please turn on your camera and leave it on because we need to for this reason. But setting those expectations, I think, is really helpful. Um, I, I know there's a bunch of other people here. Are there, I want to open this to the floor. Are there other thoughts on how to build psychological safety or motivation for neurodiverse people? And I'm also acknowledging the time. So, um, uh, Oh, we, we're at three. I can yeah, keep going yeah. if people would like to, but we can also exactly. stop if we need to. Yeah. So any I other questions? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, Jasmine, go ahead. That's all right. That was an accidental hand. I was... Oh. <laughs> I'm so trying, to, trying to lower it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Got it. Um, cool. Well, it seems like a, a bunch of people are dropping off uh, at the top of the hour. Um, how would people, what's the best way to, re to, to reach out to you or if they have any other questions? Are you part of the Slack community? or I'm in the Slack community. I admittedly don't check it as much as I probably should, but I'm going to put my email in the chat. Cool. And feel free to reach out there. You can also get on my website if you'd like. Um, there's some ways to contact me there. But um, thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate your time here, and I hope this was useful. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Good Bye. to see everyone.